Hey there, I'm Christy. Welcome to my channel. It's a bright and sunny day. It's a little chilly outside though. The wind is blowing, but it's a great day to get started working in the greenhouse. And I thought today would be a really great day to actually share some information about seed starting and how much a person should plant if you are growing food for your family for a year. So I'll share with you what I do and how I figure that out. I just need to grab my sunglasses because it's super bright in the greenhouse. It's gonna be so much better. Ha, huh, I can see without blinding myself. Um, the beautiful thing about living in Northern Alberta is that the snow is really pretty but um, it's really reflective and it's hard on the eyes. So we're going to the greenhouse over there. bright in here. Whew. It's bright on the eyes. Okay, so uh, it's it's a beautiful day in here. It's actually really nice and warm. Um, even though it's like minus 15-ish with the wind chill, minus 15 degrees Celsius outside in the wind chill, it is really quite nice in here today. And so I'm just checking on my raised beds in here to see how dry they are, if I need to have any special amendments for these, these, um, for this, these particular boxes. This is going to be where I'm able to grow my food the earliest here in our climate. Our last frost date is May 25th. And so I'm just evaluating my space right now. It is still way too early to plant in here because this is a cold frame. My other greenhouse, it is a heated greenhouse, but we don't have it assembled right now. We are waiting for some nicer weather to get that done, um, where we're not gonna drive the frost down into the ground and such. So I'm not planting in there yet. I'm a little behind schedule with all of my wanting to do's. And because I grow food for my family for the entire year, this is stuff that I do have to think about um, and be in consideration of like my soil, um, getting it amended so that when it's time to get going and planting, I'm not fiddling around with this, trying to make it work. But the reason I wanted to do this video today is not about amending my beds. I'm just kind of evaluating that right now. What I wanted to talk to you about is something that I see coming up a lot right now. Um, I'm just checking. He's still there. It kind of looked like my, my record stopped. You're still there. Good. <laughs> um, just, just checking. If you're, if you're growing food for your family, um, however many people's in your family, like how much do you need to grow? What do you need to plant? How many seeds should you buy? Um, you know, lots of people who are new to gardening, those are unanswered questions. And the short answer I can give you is, you know, I could give you a mathematical number that works for me. And I'm going to give you my specific exact max mathematical number of specific types of plants and how many I grow for our family. But you have to keep in mind where I live. I live in a climate way up in Northern Alberta where we have long, long, long sunny days, but it gets cold at night. We are not a warm place. Um, it is very chilly. A lot of the times, even in the summertime, our warm nights can sometimes hover right around 15 degrees Celsius um, or 20 degrees Celsius is usually, that's scorching hot for us. So my crops 
that do really well here for me may not do well for you, but it is a generalization of, you know, every, basically, the best way I can put this is every variety that I grow grows best for my, for my environment, and every variety has um, species or variants of themselves that work in every environment. So you could grow a tomato um, that does really well for you, but it does really bad for me. Even if you have a 100 day season and I have a 100 day season, your tomato does better than mine because of the temperatures. There are tomatoes that will do better for you than will do for me because they're bred for that and vice versa. Sometimes my tomatoes that I grow here do better for me because of my environment that they, they would not do well for you because of your environment. So those are all really important factors to keep in mind. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, sometimes it's just a little research or communication. Get on your social media and say, hey, gardening friends, where are you at? Tell me what varieties are good, grow good here. And there is a starting point. Every single um, victory comes with experience. And that is the main motivation behind every decision when it, when it comes to buying a seed packet when you're just starting out is who has grown it before? You know, yeah, there's pretty information, lots of really beautiful information and write-ups on seed packets, but who has actually grown it? Where have where has it been successful? What varieties do my market gardens grow in my area? What do the avid gardeners grow? What does the garden center sell? What do the garden centers say I should grow? Um, talk to people that know what they're talking about and they will direct you in an area of what varieties are suited best for your area. But I am gonna give you specific numbers, don't worry. It's not all about chit chat, it's more about specific numbers here. So hold on, I'm getting them. I do actually have it wrote down for you so I didn't forget any of the main ones that I see are pretty common. Um, so I'll explain, I'll kind of explain as I go why and how I'm using them to preserve for my family and whoop, and I'll knock you over in the process. Stay still, would ya? <laughs> Stay. Okay. Um, are you gonna fall? I told you to stay. <laughs> Some of the things that I preserve a lot of our pasta so pasta sauces, tomato products, salsa, those kind of things. Now, when I preserve that stuff, I do multiple batches. And one of my favorite things to do, and this is something that's new to me this past year that I didn't do before because I didn't have access to doing this, but I learned it's my favorite thing. And let me tell you, there's a million other ways, but this is what I've been doing. I make my big batch of salsa as my garden is coming in. Usually it's a double or triple batch, and that's what I do every year. And then what I do with everything else as it's coming in is I freeze it so that I can either later freeze dry it or I immediately freeze dry it. And I know lots of people don't have access to that, but I used to just freeze it. I used to like skip the step of freeze drying and just freeze it. The reason I really love freeze drying it is because I love thicker sauces. I love chunky salsa, and I can get that consistency without cooking the crap out of everything. Um, without over processing everything if I was to do it as a freeze dried. Alternatively, you know, and, and I wanna keep all those minerals. I wanna keep that nutrition. I don't wanna freeze stuff or cook stuff until, you know, cook the snot out of it until there's nothing left of it as nutrition and it's all in those sauce because it'll cook out of the actual texture of the food. And so that's one of the things like I've learned. I like to lock that in so that when I do can it, it's all in that salsa. We're still having nutrition when we're eating salsa or pasta sauce, where a lot of processes, you know, you lose a lot of that nutrition. Um, not all of it. I mean, it's still healthier than a lot of other things, but um, you do lose a percentage of nutrition, let's just be honest, when you do over-process things. So um, that's, you know, that's what I do. I freeze dry and then I, I do that. But Prior to me having a freeze dryer, I would just freeze it and then do it that way. And then if I had extra sauce, um, I would just use that and can that sauce and either use it as a base for cooking like rice or soups or stuff like that. But how many tomatoes do I need in a year? How many tomato plants do I need in a year to be sustainable for my family of three? Now, there are some factors here in our house. My husband used to be in camp. 
for the whole winter and I would be here pretty much by myself taking care of his his like his son which we had a shared custody have a shared custody so you know we have that factor of him going back and forth between houses so a lot of times I was here by myself so I didn't need to preserve as much food because I wasn't you know I was the only one here and stuff like that um for a majority of the of the time in the winter time so I didn't need that much um but now things have changed you know he's home every single night so and my stepson is home you know you know, he, we have a schedule where he's here most of the time and, um, you know, he's a growing boy. He eats a lot. How many tomatoes do I need? Well, the way that I figure this out is I'll take a variety that's pretty common. Um, early girl tomato is pretty common. I think that you guys grow, you know, the majority of people everywhere grow early girl tomatoes. Now, early girl tomatoes are not the earliest tomato that I grow. They are not my favorite tomato. They're actually one of my least favorite tomatoes, but I grow them because they're dependable and they are a staple in the back end of a lot of the sauces and food that I do because I can guarantee I'm gonna get something. They're kind of like my insurance policy when it comes to food. And it sounds weird, um, but I know no matter what, there is gonna be tomatoes if I'm growing early girls. And you know, because I have a very short season where I don't have a lot of heat, I did grow some in here in the cold frame, but even then my cold frame stays cold in the summer. So I can grow a lot of heat loving plants like peppers and they don't do well because it cools off so much at night that they just don't thrive. So I need to have a heated greenhouse that holds heat much more efficiently in order for me to grow those like hothouse tomatoes or anything that needs any heat like tomatoes and peppers. So, um, Early girl is so fast and it, it just gets the job done. Now, how many plants and early girls do I need for my family um, now that everyone's home all the time and we're eating three meals a day home cooked? I mean, we don't eat tomatoes usually for breakfast unless we're using the ketchup on our eggs that I do make. I do make ketchup. I, this year I made barbecue sauce, a double batch of barbecue sauce. I made a double batch of ketchup. I made six canners of of diced stewed tomatoes. I made two batches of um, cat, like tomato sauce. And I made six batches of salsa and three, four batches of pasta sauce. I grew a thousand pounds of tomatoes this year, uh, this past year. Now I would, should have had a way more, but we had really bad hail damage because those were supposed to be market garden tomatoes. I failed with that because we had a really bad hailstorm, knocked off everything off my plants. So I couldn't sell any to the other canners in my area, but it did, I still did, was able to harvest about a thousand pounds. Now I still have tomatoes, <laughs> way more tomatoes that I need still frozen in my freezer. So um, let's talk about the number of, of plants that I can, I, I've grown early girl tomatoes. I can give you specific numbers, what I know. The, the fruit of them is usually around six ounces, right? I had some much bigger and much smaller than that, but average for me, when I grew those tomatoes, the average size of that fruit was about six ounces. Now, in order for me with my recipes to coincide with what I'm growing, I know that three tomatoes is about one pound. Um, and then I can convert that to how many pounds I need for my recipe. So three tomatoes, three, three actual tomatoes. So how many tomatoes does that plant actually grow in our season? Now, um, I'm just gonna go off my records of what my average was on my tomato plants. This was after hail damage and stuff. So it's not gonna be specifically accurate, but it was accurate for me last year. And this is what happened, how, I, how much I got off of them. Um, but each plant grows about 10 pounds to 15 pounds of fruit is what I harvested off my early girls last year. So 10 to 15 pounds, and it was about the same the previous year, 10 to 15 pounds of fruit off of those plants in our growing season. Now these are indeterminate, so they just keep growing until the frost takes them out. And so um, I, in order for me to do um, one batch, one batch of tomato products, for myself, um, one like one large batch of how I preserve, I tend have I have this rule of thumb um, for every batch of tomato products that I make, I want ten plants. 
that is my insurance to know that I'm going to have enough. And if there's any surplus, I can put that in the freezer and make, you know, something else like an, a batch of ketchup or a batch of barbecue sauce. I have, I have almost as much tomato products as Costco. <laughs> I swear to you, but um, I'm good for, I'm good for a long time. Yeah. My rule of thumb is that if I want to make four batches of salsa, I want to have 40 plants. So if I want, and I mean, that's a lot. I mean, my batches, my batches of recipes are like a big roaster. Look at your, look at your recipe. And, and I guess here's a great tip. If you're trying to figure this out, how much you're going to need to plant. So I do know approximately one plant will produce an average about 10 to 15 pounds of fruit. If they have a good, a fairly average season, um, in a short season. So other people might say, no, mine gets 30, you know, mine gets way more. My, my plants produce way more than that. And that's fine. But on average, you want to go with the lowest of, um, like the lowest of situation, which was me last year when my plants got wiped out with hail, they produced 10 to 15 pounds of fruit. Um, and that was a really hard year on them. So that would be my security to say, this would be my number to base it on. So this year I know, um, how many batches of things I want to make. So I'm going to run with, you know, so many tomatoes based on these numbers, right? So 10 plants per batch of tomato products, three, six ounce tomatoes makes one pound of tomatoes and each plant, um, you know, how much, how much fruit does that one plant produce? 10 to 15 pounds, <laughs> it's just this circle. Corn, corn is one that I grew, a lot of corn will grow. Usually I, I plan my corn harvest or crops to be one, um, one ear. So I, even though that most of the time they will put multiple ears of corn, um, I plan to do one ear. So the way I evaluate how much corn to plant, I consider one plant as one ear of corn, right? And even though it will produce way more than that, sometimes three, um, usually I just, that's my, you know, we have such a short season that that's kind of my security to know, okay, if I plant my corn, I started inside two weeks before planting out. And then, it, you know, I planted out once the soil, when, we, when we're in warmer days sometime in the beginning of June, probably like the second week of June, I know by the end of the season, I will at least have one developed ear of corn that I can then preserve for my family. So the way, you know, I, I kind of, I think of it as, okay, every single plant that I have planted represents one person, one serving. And it's easy for me to think about that because then everything else is bonus. That's then I can make the corn salsa or, you know, the, I can, I can do other preserving with it. Um, I can dry it, grind it up and make tortillas or whatever, you know, I have the freeze jar to do that. And so, you know, it makes it really easy for that extra bonus products. If I have so much space, that's how I run it. Um, so this year I'm going to, I'm going to go with my numbers from last year and how I calculated it. Um, so I figure out how many times per week I will cook with corn, right? I figure, I figure, okay, how many, how many times do I cook with corn? And I cook about three times a week on, as an estimate, I would say that probably twice a week is more accurate, but we'll say three times a week because Chaz and Tyson would love it if I cook three times a week with corn. They love corn. Um, but that's kind of my number I'm gauging for. Now I cook with it. So I need, I need, um, nine, right? I need nine, um, serving. So nine plants per week, um, for the duration of time that we eat out of our preserved food. So I plant, um, one plant per family member per week on the weeks that we consume. So that means if we eat three, if we eat corn three times per week, right? If we eat corn like three times per week, um, I need to plan nine plants and I need to times that by the number of weeks per year we're eating out of our preserved corn. Now, um, for us, we eat out of our preserved corn for six months out of the year. So then I multiply that by four, right? And that gives me 24 weeks. So 24 weeks, um, I need nine, nine corn, corn plants, right? Nine corn plants times 24 weeks. 
which is 216 plants that I need to have in my garden space. Um, so I need to buy at least a packet of seeds that has 200 seeds and or more, right? Um, in order for me to have enough corn to feed my family of three. Now, when it comes to cooking, when I talk about cooking, like I don't give one cob of corn every time. Like I shuck the corn and I put it in the freezer. Um, like I individually freeze it, like um, so it's loose in the bag. And so then what I do is I'll grab a handful and throw it in. So I don't always use that much. So I always have a surplus of corn, but you know, um, it's nice to gauge that so that at the end of the season, if I have a whole bunch of corn left over, I'm like, hey, I have lots of corn left over. I can make a corn meal by drying it and you know doing it that way. Or I have food for my animals. Um, I can feed that to the chickens and stuff, or even the horses, really, um, or the pigs or the whatever. Right? There's there's also that abundance is never going to go to waste. So that's how I gauge that, right? Um, and I hope that that you know just kind of plug your numbers in with how much you consume per week. Um, how many weeks of the year you're going to be eating out of that and also you know how much you want to preserve so canning you would just kind of I would say like I would consider depending on the corn size I would say um, one cup of corn per cob or like I would go like even if you're having a smaller cob of corn size you could do it that way or if you're wanting to preserve some so that you can dehydrate it kind of gauge it i might i run the, the easy number i run in my head is one cup per cob of of corn when i shuck it and that's just my generalization because a lot of the corn i grow is a little bit smaller i do have some larger sizes but it usually is about one cup of corn um per per cob that i gauge when I'm measuring out how much I'm gonna need for canning recipes. Okay, summer squash, the zucchini and the summer squash. Now, the way that I use summer squash, I usually will grate it and freeze it. I always use uh, zucchini and summer squash in my sauces. I use it both in my salsa and I also use it in my pasta sauce. And also if I make soup, I will put it in there as well. How I gauge that and I can grow here in my environment, we don't have the pest pressure that many of you do in warmer climates. So like we don't have the squash, whatever, what is it, squash bug? What is, what is it, squash beetle? I don't know the name, tell me, we don't have that. Um, we sometimes will get blight, um, we get aphids, but they don't tend to bother that very much. Um, we do get rabbits tend to be the worst or mice, mice are the worst. and. My cats, they need to do their jobs. Basically, I the way I gauge it is because our zucchini is so vigorous, I direct so one plant per person of each variety. So I will grow one gr variety of green of a green zucchini and one variety of a yellow squash type zucchini. Um, and what I do is I plant one one plant per person in our family. So before Chaz, um, when he was smaller, I never really counted him. I counted him and I as one person um, because I eat less than Tyson and Chaz eats less than Tyson as well. So like it was the way that it, it gauged. Um, I was, it, it was kind of like when he was little, right? When he's a little guy, I didn't need as much. Now that he's bigger, I count him as one individual in um, our household. Um, who would consume that much food. And I know that's kind of a messed up way to think about it, but um, it's just kind of the rule I follow because it's easy to figure out on the fly when I, you know, if I, I, instead of going, well, if there's one and a half, it's just him and I are one. Um, and then Tyson is the second. And now that Chaz has grown, Chaz is the third person in our household um, who, who deserves his own zucchini plant. So he gets two plants um, dedicated to him to grow his food for the whole year. Now, the way I use it is as it's coming in, I grate it and freeze it. But what I've been doing this past year that is my absolute favorite is I either dice it up into little cubes or I shred it and I freeze dry it. Then when it's time to make my pasta sauces or, or salsa, I add a ton of that right on in. Um, I also can use it when I'm baking and cooking that way um, as a flour or like a 
um, kind of instead of using it at, in baking as a wet ingredient, I'm able to use less dry ingredients of flour and substituting it with zucchini um, that's either crushed up or shredded because it's dry. And so it switches it from being a wet ingredient to a dry ingredient, which makes me save a whole bunch of money on uh, flour and whatnot. So, and it's a lot more healthier. So that's how I do that. Um, I go three green and three yellow, and that's how I run my zucchini. We eat a lot of it fresh in the summer. Um, and I usually let them get, you know, like that big and not to get too big. And we, we have, our varieties are vigorous here. They grow very, very well. For carrots, we use 12 carrots per week. So for carrots, the way I do it, you know, I figure out how many carrots a week do I use? And I gauge it by, we usually use a pound and usually that's about, that can be about a bag, um, a, a bag of carrots. His usually has about 10, 10 carrots in it. So, um, 10 or 12 carrots in it. And depending on the size, obviously. So I, you know, we usually, Chaz takes it in his lunch. His favorite food is carrot. His favorite vegetable is carrot. So he takes carrots in his lunch every single day in, to school. And I use carrots in pretty much everything I cook when it comes to soups. Like I put carrots in every soup just about that I make. Um, and I, I do grate it into pancakes. I also grate it into cakes and muffins or cookies. I like to make carrot cookies and carrot zucchini. I, I use that grated version of that. Um, I have not freeze dried carrots grated, but I do freeze it. And I find it's very, very, very um, versatile and I use it a lot. So my, I, I gauge it. So 12 months of the year, we are using at least 12 carrots per week. I mean, that, and that's just fresh eating. How I store them is I put them either in the frid, refrigerator in plastic with paper towel to keep the moisture in and they just go dormant. I don't cut the tops off, I let Whoops, what I meant to say was that I do cut off the green part, but I don't actually cut the carrot. I do try to keep a little bit of green on it so it just goes dormant. Let them have their stem because when you don't cut their tops off and you store them, they don't die, they don't just stop existing. They go into a dormancy and they can stay that way for just about a whole year. Um, and lots of times in the spring, if I pull a carrot out out of the storage, I could plant it in the ground, it'll start growing again, because it's just dormant. So that's how I do it. I also will put them into totes like, I don't know, can you see that? Like totes like these. And I will put sawdust in there um, and then put it on the garage floor where it gets, it stays around five degrees Celsius. And that's like a refrigerator and it, it maintains moisture and they just go into dormancy. And I store them that way. Um, and so how much do I need to buy for seeds? How many seeds do I plant? Um, well, if we're using 12 carrots per week, we have 12 carrots times 48 weeks, we will eat 576 carrots. So we are consuming 576 carrots per year um, in our household, average, averaging. Now that's just fresh eating, that doesn't include ca canning. So um, what I do is I, when I plant, I'm, I'm usually timesing that by two. So if I need to grow 500 carrots, or say, we'll say 600 carrots, I need to grow or plant 1200 seeds, right? Um, so I usually, will plant no less than 1100, 1200 seeds um, to get that number so that I, even if half of my carrots do not survive, and if I'm thinning half of them out, I still hit that, I should be close to that target and of my six, around 600 carrots or 576 carrots target um, for the year of fresh eating. Now, if I'm doing canning, if I'm making dill, uh, pickled carrots, um, I times it by three if I'm doing preserving. So if I'm pickling and then I'm shredding them and putting them in the freezer for later use, I will times that by three. So I will times 576 carrots based on the number we consume. So 12 carrots per week in a family of three. So you could figure that out too, whatever your family members are, how many average you, you would use for your family number. And then 
I uh, multiply that by three for pickling and shredding. So then that gives me, excuse me, <laughs> I'm gonna get the hiccups. I, I times it by three and that will give me the number, you, like I would need 1700, about 1728, right? 1728 um, of carrot seeds to plant. So about 1800, 1800 carrot seeds is how much I would buy for our family to grow for fresh eating, to preserve for fresh eating and to preserve the accounting or freezing, I would need to to purchase right around 17 or right around 1800. We'll say, we'll round it up. We'll say around 1800 carrot seeds to plant out um, with the intention to harvest at least 50% of that amount. That makes sense, I hope. There are so many ways to figure this stuff out, but this is how I do it for myself. And I don't know if it's helpful for you. There's still more, but I don't know if it's helpful for you at all. I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that it is, it's, it's giving some information that helps you gauge what you could plant um, and how much you would need and how much you need to spend. Because, you know, like we can go to the seed shop and spend thousands of dollars. It's very easy to do. Um, and have too much of one thing and not enough of something else. So this is kind of my reality check of how I keep myself in order. So let's talk peppers. Now, tomatoes and peppers should really go together because um, with the canning part of it, but um, bell peppers, in my experience, we don't have a lot of heat. So even in the best situation, my peppers, the best that my bell peppers can produce on average is right around three peppers. Three to 10 peppers I think would be pretty average if you have like a, a really ideal year here for bell peppers in our climate. I mean, you have to remember, like this is where I am on the map, right? So bell peppers are a, a warm season crop and this is not someplace they want to live, but um, I have to compensate for the fact that we live in a really cold place. So, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not ideal. But um, so on average, I would gauge that I'm calculating the best I've ever gotten is 10 peppers off of a, 10 bell peppers off of a plant. And the worst I've ever really gotten was about three on average. So I'm gonna go with three. That's my number I'm gonna use to calculate how much I need to grow for bell peppers. So, um, and then the hot, the hot peppers are different. I'm just gonna go through the bell peppers right now and then share with you after the, after the bell peppers what I do for hot peppers because they're very, very, very different. Um, because peppers are not all ready at one time, I, I tend to preserve them multiple ways. I will chop them up and I freeze them so that I can use them in stir fries. Like I will slice them to make like fajitas. Um, or I will chop them for making stir fries or whatever, right? Like I, I do chop them and freeze them. I preserve, I freeze dry. I like to chop up my peppers and freeze dry them, put them in mason jars in my kitchen, and then I just grab handfuls and throw them in um, when I'm cooking a casserole or when I'm cooking you know, a stir fry or eggs in the morning. I will you know, reconstitute some peppers to throw in with my eggs, it only takes a few minutes to do. Super easy, super convenient. And I just keep, I don't let any peppers go to waste. If it looks like it's in my fridge and I'm not gonna be able to use it up in the summertime, I chop it up, freeze it. I loosely freeze it until I get one whole batch. Um, and then I put that on a freeze dry tray and then I put that in my freeze dryer and freeze dry it. So um, I run one whole batch of peppers at a time and I just keep collecting them throughout the season. And that's how I got onto using my peppers that way because they're not all done at the same time. Um, they, they, they kind of have a longer season for us here. They don't produce like one big flush. So I have to kind of pick and then let it reproduce and pick and let it reproduce. And so that's what works the best for me is freeze dry it. And then I take that freeze dried peppers and the freeze dried ingredients like the zucchini. And then I make my sauces with it later when everything has come in and I'm not so busy. Cause oh, flower farm, growing your food. What are you doing, Alvin? <laughs> what? My animals, they're just weird. Anyway, that's what I, I preserve. I preserve that way because it really helps me um, 
save time. I mean, it, when you're growing all of your own food, to preserve and to grow it is, it's unrealistic. Let's be real. It is unrealistic to harvest and grow it and preserve it all at the same time. It ain't gonna happen. Like, and if you can do it at the scale that I'm doing it and preserve it as it's coming in constantly, like, I don't know how you do it. You should give me your superpowers because I really, there's a lot that goes into gardening and, and it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And so I find it's most efficient for me to quickly freeze dry it or quickly freeze it and then deal with it later to make my stuff later. Um, however, if I have a little time, if it's raining for three days and I can't be out in the garden, I will go and whip out a whole bunch of batches of salsa or pasta sauce. I will just get going with it because I can't do nothing else, right? So that's what I do. That's how I roll with it. So how many peppers do I need for, for our family of three? Um, we, I gauge it about two peppers per week. Now I gauge that because um, I don't really have an answer of how I got myself to that um, conclusion, but several years ago, I went with this number to guesstimate somehow, I don't know, the intuitive gods opened up and said, yes, that's your number. Um, but two pepper, two bell peppers per week was the number I, for some reason, come up with, um, for our family. And that includes, um, that includes, um, what I use it for preserving and canning. So three, three, or sorry, two peppers per week for the whole year was my magic number. Now, when I plant according to this, based on three bell peppers per plant, I usually have just the right amount or just under, maybe I have to go buy a couple peppers from the store. Um, so, you know, and it's usually to do with some sort of a loss, um, maybe hail or an early frost or something that something happened or, you know, um, sometimes peppers, I don't know, they're just sometimes they're smaller and sometimes they're bigger. So it's hard to gauge. They're not always uniform here because of the weather. So sometimes we get giant peppers and sometimes we get little ones. And so it's really hard to tell. Um, but the, you know, in the end of the season, I usually only have to buy a few peppers. Um, usually I can grow enough to do all the things I want to do for the freezing, the fresh eating and the, and stuff. So I'm gauging it on 48 weeks times two peppers. So 48 weeks in the year times two, two bells that we would consume is 96 peppers per year of what we, our family of three would consume. Um, so that divided that by three, because there's three peppers per plant on a low average in my, in my growing area, I would need 32 plants to grow that enough peppers to feed my entire family and can um, salsa and whatever else I use peppers for, for my family for the whole year. Now, that is what works for me. I need 32 bell pepper plants to be sustainable um, in my climate. So, you know, we're a family of three. You can, you, I cook differently than probably all of you, but that's what works for me. That's my number. And that's what I'm going with this year. Um, I'm doubling it a little bit because I am doing some preserving for other family members as well this year and growing for other family members. So I did up my pepper game for bells, but, um, and I'm also growing inside of a heated structure, a heated greenhouse. So that's gonna extend my season and I'm hoping to have higher yields. This spicy stuff. Oh, these are my favorite. Uh, <laughs> okay, hot peppers for salsa. This, you will never convince me Never, never, never convince me otherwise that Hungarian hot wax peppers are the best peppers on the planet because I can grow them and I can grow a crazy amount of peppers here in our climate. They are awesome peppers. I love them. I love them. I love them. Um, so those, the, the what I'm basing my numbers on are based on Hungarian hot wax pepper, which... I would say if you live in a hotter climate where the summer days get much, much warmer, it would probably be very equivalent, you know, to other varieties that I can't grow. Jalapenos for me here don't grow well. They are awful. So I am growing them in my greenhouse, my heated greenhouse over there. I'll sh over, over there eventually once 
the top is on, um, I will be growing them there. So um, hopefully, hopefully we will get something out of them. What I know for my salsas, um, because I don't keep them really spicy. And a lot of my Hungarian hot wax, hot wax peppers, they get large, like they're quite big. So I don't have to use a lot like compared to other peppers. And so per batch, I would gauge approximately 20 peppers per batch of salsa. Um, and so I um, usually do four batches, I would say of salsa and they're large. They're very, very large batches, like a big, 16 quart roaster is a is a batch of salsa for me so for me to do that i would need about 80 peppers i would say the hungarian hot wax pepper the worst a hungarian hot wax pepper has ever performed for me um the worst it ever performed was i got five peppers off the plant but the average or the the i would say the the average would be 20. i would say that i could get about 20 peppers off of each hungarian hot wax pepper on a pretty average year here um, but the worst of the worst years I've ever had growing experience, I have gotten five peppers off of a, one, one plant. So I'm going with that low number to kind of evaluate. I always go with the worst. <laughs> the worst case scenario, this is what I'm gauging for. So I can, you know, then maybe preserve more so the next year I can grow less kind of a thing. That's always my goal. The 20 peppers per batch of Per, per batch times four is 80 peppers for salsa. And so I would need 80, 80 divided by five because the worst case scenario is ever grown is it's only ever grown five, five peppers. Um, I need 16 plants of the Hungarian hot wax pepper just to make my salsa for the year. So I also like to, what I do is I chop up the into little pieces and I really like to freeze dry them and then put them in mason jars in my kitchen as well and then put them into my um, egg wraps or omelets or nachos if I, if I um, or actually I've even grabbed handfuls and put them in meatballs or hamburgers and mixing up in only a couple tablespoons or even grind it up and make like a powder as a seasoning. Um, there's so, it is so versatile, just, but I like to freeze dry my peppers. If I have extra, I almost always just make hot sauce and I freeze it. And then I can pull that hot sauce out, hot sauce out and put it in the quick cooker with some chicken as a meal, or I can put it in a, in a hot sauce bottle and use it as like a sriracha. Um, or last year I was planning to ferment it, but I didn't have enough peppers because the weather had took them out. So this year, um, I'm growing, my, my gauge for peppers is in my mind, I'm, I'm growing 16 Hungarian hot wax peppers specifically to make salsa. And then I have all these other goals that I want to do where I'm, I'm saying, okay, I want a batch of hot sauce, another 16 plants. I want a batch of this, another 16 plants. And that's how I'm gauging it. Jalapenos, I make, jal I make cowboy candy. Jalapenos do not grow well here. I try <laughs> and I try and I try and no. Um, but I do purchase 75 to 100 actual peppers to make cowboy candy. And so I do know that on average, based on um, what it's supposed to do, like these really small, cause they, they grow really small. So if for me to do the equivalency of that, I do know that it will, I will need about eight plants. Um, so, um, basically one plant produces 10 peppers is what they say, um, is the average for our area, but they're little. Um, I would say I would need to have eight to 10 plants, um, to do my batches of, batches of, uh, cowboy candy that I do and to add into the hot sauces and whatever else. Right. So that's that, or, you know, for poppers or whatnot green beans green beans grow really really well here i grow two varieties that are my favorite there's another variety that i grew last year i'm not going to grow it again and i grew it the year before i'm not going to grow it it's not my favorite but i do have two favorites the purple peacock is what my my one of my favorites and then the yellow uh bush bean and i love 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 them they are they're a heritage seed 
the, the yellow bush bean is a heritage seed here. Um, it's an heirloom to our area, specific to our area. And I f always find that that's the, the best way to go. Get what grows for your area. For the yellow bush beans, I plant six plants um, each year. I don't, I don't exceed that. So that's two, two plants per person in our family. And I can harvest and harvest. And, and that usually gives us enough servings through the whole season that I can use in baking or cooking or sides and whatnot when I freeze them or use them in casseroles. That seems to be the magic number that works really, really well for us. And I've done that pretty much every year where I did the six, the six bush bean, yellow bush bean produces the perfect amount of yellow beans for us to eat um, just out of fr our frozen and, and in cooking. We don't, we, we kind of go through stages where we eat a lot of beans and then we don't, but the purple pe peacock beans, they are perfect for freezing. And um, I like, if, if I'm canning, I'm gonna do eight to 10 plants for dilly beans. Um, and that's kind of what I do, cause you wanna make, it takes a lot of beans to get into those jars. So that's what I find is just upping the game. Um, on them and then you get a really good harvest of fresh beans, a really good harvest of beans for eating for our family of three. So if I'm eating fresh to preserve and I'm canning, I plant eight to 10 plants total. I don't need any more than that. Otherwise I have way too many beans um, and then we won't use them. But my favorite ways is to freeze them, make them into dilly beans and, um, cause they're really good with vodka and um, freeze dry. I freeze dry them. I use them in tuna casseroles. That's my favorite way to get you to use them up is in casseroles. I could go on and on and on. And I might do, if, if there's interest, I might do another video of what I'm planting and how many I'm planting and why and how I derived that number. But um, right now, this is all my voice. <laughs> I've been talking all day. I talk too much. As my husband would say, it's like, you talk too much. You're always talking. You just like to talk to hear yourself talk. I feel like that right now, but I hope that that was very, very helpful for you. I'm getting a little chilly. It's beautiful. It's nice and warm in here, but I am getting a little bit of a chill. My toes are getting cold, so I'm going to get to work. I have a lot to do. Um, I'm probably not going to amend the soil today because um, I was planning to bring a hose in. I got to show you this really quickly. I have not been watering. It's just dust. So what I need to start doing is I need to get my hose from over there, drug out and bring it in here and start soaking these beds um, and adding some fresh compost into here because it's just so dry. Um, and that will help warm it up in here too. But yeah, it is super, super dry. Oh, I can see. <laughs> there you are, hi. Um, the sun was so bright it went behind the clouds for a minute. But let's take a look and see how much snow there is. Oh boy. I don't know if I'm gonna get to my wheelbarrow anytime soon. <laughs> you can't even see my raised beds. That is a raised bed there. Very, very deep. Well, anyways, I hope you enjoyed today's content. I hope you consider giving it a like and a subscribe. And I will see you next time. Bye for now. Take care. Much love.